Hello everyone and welcome to this eChurch video for Sunday the 17th of October, a Sunday on which the part of Lincoln in which we find ourselves uh, is full of people racing push bikes. Uh, it's quite dramatic and quite noisy and it does have a big impact on the number of people who are able to t attend church in person. But we have this alternative video offering uh, that's available and also a chance this time to participate in Zoom worship with our friends and neighbours at St Mary Magdalene's Church. And we do encourage those who are prevented from being uh, in the church building to make use of one or both of these resources. Continue to pray that they will help you to continue in your life of Christian prayer, worship and discipleship. May God bless you all. God, our light and our salvation, illuminate our lives, that we may see your goodness in the land of the living, and looking on your beauty may be changed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptised with the baptism that I am baptised with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptised you will be baptised. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognise as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. First things first, you need to make sure that you're not mixing up your Jameses. Make sure that you're not mixing up your Jameses. I've made that mistake in the past, that's why I mention it. James of the letter of James that we've heard a lot of over the summer, he is James the Less possibly Jesus's brother, we're not sure. And the James in today's gospel reading of James and John fame, he's James the Great, the son of Zebedee, a fisherman and nicknamed the son of thunder by Jesus in Mark chapter three. James the Great and John the Apostle, sons of thunder, possibly because of their speech or their temperament, and their ambition. Remember James and John in Luke chapter 9 offering to call down fire from heaven on the Samaritans to destroy them after they refused to show hospitality to Jesus and his disciples when they're passing through. You can imagine Jesus' face when they say that, can't you? Like, no, please don't do that. That won't be necessary. There doesn't need to be any destruction by fire today. And James was one of Jesus' inner circle, <clears throat> along with John, his brother, and Peter. James the Great is the only apostle whose death is recorded in the Bible. Herod had him killed, as it says in Acts chapter 12, probably in Jerusalem, probably about 10 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. I have quite a lot of sympathy with James the Great and his brother John, sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. And so I suspect does everyone who sometimes lets their enthusiasm and their ego get in the way. To be fair to them, how must it have been to be with Jesus, alongside him on the road, watching him teach, hearing the astounding things that he was saying, to be able to reach out and touch Jesus, to be convinced of the truth of his words? All of Jesus' disciples, whose words and actions 
we have recorded in scripture say or do things that are a little bit silly or a little bit weird. All of them make mistakes and all of them misunderstand. And what a colossal misunderstanding this one is. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus said, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. It sounds preposterous and terribly rude, but to be honest, how many times do we ask Jesus the exact same question? Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's very easy to fall into that pattern of prayer when we're overwhelmed with problems and tasks and worries. Dear Lord, please do this. Please bless this. Please make this happen. Dear Lord, please do for us whatever we ask. And it's easy for us to imagine that we do metaphorically belong at Jesus' right hand, that we are his special ones and that he is some sort of heavenly fairy godmother who will grant us our wishes if only we ask nicely and if only we ask over and over and over again. It doesn't work like that. Prayer should not be like that. We have to ask ourselves seriously, what if what we want is not what Jesus wants? What if what we want is not what Jesus wants? What if there is a bigger picture, a bigger plan that we can't possibly understand? What if, as we say, please, please, please do this for us, Jesus is thinking, please, will you just listen to me? I think it's interesting that when James and John say, please do for us whatever we ask, Jesus doesn't say, absolutely not. Who do you think you are? He says, what do you want me to do for you? And that's a question that Jesus is forever asking people who come to him for help. What is it you want? What can I do for you? And I think in this instance, Jesus is asking a question, not just about what James and John are asking for, but about what they want, what their desire is. What do you want? It's a question that Jesus is forever asking us. But how often are we really honest? How often do we fill our conversations with Jesus with half truths and surface level concerns? Jesus is asking a deeper question. What is at the root of all that? What do you want? James and John are asking to sit beside Jesus in glory, but what they want is recognition, power, influence, lasting fame. They're Jesus' closest friends, so shouldn't everybody know? Shouldn't they have their seats in pride of place in heaven? Remember, James and John have witnessed Jesus' transfiguration, as we're told in the previous chapter. They see a foretaste of the glory of heaven. They see Jesus there with the two most important figures in Judaism, Moses and Elijah, and this gets them thinking, shouldn't we, shouldn't we make sure that when we all get to heaven, the three of us can be together so that everybody knows? I don't know where they thought Peter should go. Maybe he should have been serving the grapes or something. The thing is, it's easy to blame James and John. It's easy to use them as examples of pride and egotism. The problem is they're just human beings. They're just people who love Jesus and work for the coming of his kingdom and journey with him and listen to his teaching. They're just people just like us. They're just people who say to Jesus, please do for us whatever we ask. After all, haven't we earned it? <clears throat> And Jesus' response to them and to us is to say, what do you really want? Hmm? How do you really see yourself in all of this? Where do you think you should be sitting? Here? Here? Hmm. I thought so. 
it's so easy to fall into that trap. It comes with the territory of growing in holiness, I think. As we grow in faith, as we progress in our Christian life, as we mature as disciples of Christ, we become more and more aware of being set apart, being made holy to serve God. How can that be bad? Well, the rest of James the Great's life is an absolute exemplar of holiness and Christian witness, and he is the first apostle to die for his faith. Eusebius of Caesarea writes that the guard who brought James into court was so moved when he saw him testify that he himself confessed that he was a Christian as well, and they were both taken away together, and on the way he asked James to forgive him. And James thought for a moment and said, I wish you peace, and kissed him. So both the guard and James were beheaded together. James's execution wasn't the first time Christians were persecuted, but it did mark the first time that one of the apostles drank the cup that Jesus drank and died on account of faith in him. <clears throat> it's not that James and John are incapable of drinking the same cup and following their calling to its inevitable conclusion. It's what they want. It's their desire and their view of themselves that is amiss. James and John seek high places in God's kingdom, but those places are not for Jesus to grant based on merit. Those places are reserved for those who come last, those whose service is not rewarded. Those places are granted in loss of ego, in humility and in sharing the cross. In other words, by emulating the son of man who came not to be served, or rewarded, but to give his life away as a ransom for many. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and all your days. Amen.